It's not as much as you might think because it requires you have a capital account, which makes it more difficult to regulate your own financial system. You have a lot of hot money going both ways. Uh, but it does mean that there is a stability injected into your system. And that stability allows you a lot more ballast. So a great example is what happened during the Nixon period when we decided to go off the gold standard. There weren't conversations about that internationally. The Nixon administration just decided almost overnight that we're going to move off and go to a full float. And in the words of the Treasury Secretary at the time, it's our currency. It's your problem. Because the alternative for everyone else was worse. Still is today. I mean, leaving aside the idea that the idea that the dollar is going away is silly. Uh, let's say it, the dollar did break as the reserve currency overnight. Let's just say that happened. Uh, then we're a normal currency and we're still the currency for the U.S. domestic economy and roughly 90% of the U.S. economy is held within the United States and another 5% is held within Mexico and Canada. So you only really have 5% exposure to the wider world. Uh, as for all of the debt, yes, a large portion of that is held abroad, but the U.S. still has control over its own money supply and that debt is already out there. And every once in a while, there's this delightful conversation uh, between some wackadoo Chinese ideologue and the U.S. Fed in St. Louis, where the wackadoo ideologue says, you know, you know, if we really want to stick to the United States, we're just going to dump all three trillion dollars of our uh, bond holdings overnight. And you always get the same snarky response from the St. Louis Fed that says something like, well, you know, that would be really interesting because the, uh, the, tr the debt would probably trade at 30 cents on the dollar very, very quickly. But I don't know if you knew this, China. But the U.S. Federal Reserve controls the U.S. money supply and it's mostly digital now. So we would just like click a couple buttons and expand the money supply by the exact number of that three trillion discounted 70 percent and retire the whole thing. You would save us over two trillion dollars in an hour and you would be out over two trillion dollars in an hour. That would be brilliant. Please do that. And then we never hear from that ideologue again because he's brought shame to China for being so <laughs> stupid. Uh, so no, uh, even in the worst case scenario where like Martian currency takes over, <laughs> the U S is still a normal currency for U S purposes. Now there is a cost in that scenario that would probably force our political leaders to be a little bit more judicious with their spending in the, in the long run, because we wouldn't be able to just dump our debt on everyone else's system. That's probably the real superpower. It allows us to not be fiscally responsible. But beyond that, which I would argue would probably, it gives us the ability to inject ourselves into any economic exchange. And I don't mean to minimize how useful that can be. That's one of the reasons why the sanctions on Iran have been so effective. And even relatively light sanctions in comparison on Russia have been effective. Because if Brazil and China are going to do a traditional exchange, the Chinese exchange yuan for dollars and then the dollars are exchanged for reals or, or going back the other direction. And that allows the United States to interrupt any exchange should it choose so. Now, the Fed is not staffed to monitor global monetary exchanges. So we don't do that unless there's a specific sanctions regime in place. But we have the option. And in a world of demographic decline and geopolitical upheaval, options are good. Uh, crypto, I mean, it really depends on which crypto asset, but let's just use Bitcoin because most people are familiar with that one. It's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, they, they print currency out of thin air and then they get someone to buy it from them. There's a second step there that's basically a pyramid scheme. <laughs> And, 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 you know, I, I know we didn't talk about this here uh, during the discussion, but it, it feels like there was a whole period of time where people were saying that those digital currencies were going to be the ones that superseded the U.S. dollar for that exact reason, because they're like, well, oh, the U.S. just prints money. Why can't we just print money? <laughs> I would argue that's not a great reason. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of him saying that? That, well, you know, they print money out of thin air. People say the government does too, and maybe we do, but we're the government. Well, the government is also responsible for regulating a $23 trillion economic system and managing roughly $25 trillion in global trade. So the scale and the reach and the active management that is required to do that also requires a monetary authority that can expand and shrink the monetary supply as is necessary. One of the many, 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 
many things that the crypto bros miss is that the money supply is not a one directional thing. And if the entire money supply is held by private interests, who has to give it up when it's time to go the other direction? And who decides who has to give it up? The thing that would help the most is building out processing capacity for any, any, and all of the materials that are going to be necessary as we lose Russian and Chinese supplies. The Inflation Reduction Act, which is a stupid name for what it actually does, is actually our first step in that direction since the 1940s. And so it's inefficient and it's overly expensive and it's sloppy. But for the first time we've done it, it's not bad. Oh, I'm not, I'm not a financial guy, so I let know, me just kind of give you the headline. Yeah. We're entering a world of capital shortage. The baby boomers are retiring globally. They're taking all their money with them. The next generation down, no matter where you are, no matter what country you're in, is smaller. So we're, if capital is more expensive, it is going to be able to demand higher returns. So if you can hold on through this transition, we're going to go back to a world like we had in the 1980s, where your financial planner actually had to do work. Couldn't just throw money at these artificial, maybe AI generated trading platforms or do high frequency trading. It's going to be about the value. And honestly, I think we're about better set up for that even today. So if you do have capital, all you have to do is wait a couple of years and the market will take care of you. Well, all of those would be shocking events that I had not forecast. I don't think any of those are very likely. I'm trying to come okay. up with something that might actually has a, has a slight chance of actually happening. Um, I could see France leaving the European Union. Wow. Okay. We'll talk again. So For them, it was always a political project, not an economic one. And I know. clearly it's now starting to cause some economic pain. Uh, I like to figure out how things work, why things work, and where that takes us. And I like to do it while I'm backpacking. So I need to get to a place where the world can't reach me. I spend at least two weeks backpacking every summer. I'm going to try to make that six this summer. Tour? Yeah, backpacking tour when you sure. were backpacking. Sure, oh, well, that's easy. I mean, it's been a long time, but a place called Cascade Saddle in New Zealand. Uh, it has alpine glow, it has morning rainbows, and you are a vertical kilometer and a half directly above the valley floor. It's a straight drop down. Mm -hmm. Now, it's um, I've freed up a little bit of time, so I am noodling over some ideas, but I'm not there yet. Uh, everything is e most easily accessible through the website, which is zeihan.com. That's where you can sign up for the newsletter. That's where you can sign up for the video log, and that's where all of the information about all of the books are. Let's talk about some of the economic sectors so you have an idea of what's coming down the pipe in that front. Now, this is what we call the total private credit curve. This is all, credit cre all private credit from all sources to all sources, mortgages, credit cards, stocks, everything. The only thing that is not included is interbank lending. So if one bank is lending overnight window monies to another bank, that's not there, but everything else. Now, from the start of this chart in 2000 to the middle in 2008, that line going up, that is the subprime crisis in a single graphic. We doubled total private credit in the United States in two years, excuse me, in seven years. It was too much. It was too fast. As a result, we had a bubble. It burst. We had a recession. In the ensuing year and a half, 5% came off of headline GDP. Since then, private credit growth has rebounded, and we're back to something much more similar to the century average. This is our baseline. Now, the same data, but this time in relative terms instead of absolute. So a little bump in the middle, again, that's a doubling. Here's the Eurozone. In the time the United States doubled total credit, the Europeans tripled it. As a result, the European financial crisis hit harder, lasted longer. Several countries, such as Italy, still haven't recovered to where they were in 2007. And because of COVID and demographics, they probably never will. Here's Greece, sevenfold increase of credit in seven years. And they're not done. Before COVID came, they were looking at least another 20% contraction on top of the 40% they had already suffered. Because of COVID, they will never recover. Here's Brazil. This is what a lost decade looks like, assuming you get the politics right. I don't know how many of you follow 
Brazilian politics. Well, actually, you know, all of you should follow Brazilian politics. I mean, do you like Game of Thrones, um, Maury Povich, the uh, the impeachment hearings, you know, drama, 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 drama. You've got to get into Brazilian politics. Holy crap. Uh, they, had a prison, they, uh, they had a presidential election a couple of years ago. And the final two guys, one guy was campaigning from prison where he had been convicted of corruption because in Brazil, you can run for office from prison. You just can't, you know, be president. And then the guy who won at his last big public rally said that the real problem with those Nazis is that they're just too soft on their domestic opponents. Wow. So this honestly is probably two lost decades. And for a country like Brazil that is so dependent on imported capital, coronavirus means that they're probably not going to return to 2019 ever either. Here we have India in purple and Turkey in black, two countries that are still early in the process. Now, both of these countries have already elected to office on, for multiple terms, ethno-nationalist leaders who have no problem using state resources to spawn race riots on purpose in order to get a bump in the polls from their more reactionary supporters. I think Trump's bad, nothing on these two. Now, you'll notice that the Turkish line, the black one, actually dipped last year. Why? Well, that was the start of their financial correction. What also happened last year? The Turks invaded Syria and Iraq. It was a distraction play. And then here's the People's Republic of China. And let me bring that down for you. Yeah. China is now the most over-credited country in human history in both relative and absolute terms. It is Enron in nation state form. Every system that we know, every company that has ever followed this model of force-fed capital has eventually collapsed. It's just a question how bad it will be. And China has now pushed this further and harder than anyone else. So it's going to be historically unique. Now, the point of all of this is that there's a large series of major financial crises that aren't just inevitable. Some of them might actually be imminent. That's a lot of money that's going to be looking for a safer location. What does foreign money want? Rule of law? hard fiscal assets, implicit government guarantees, dividends. If you're looking to tap global credit for local development, there will never be a better time than right now. All right, that's finance. Let's look at energy. What we've got here is a price breakdown. So the broader the bar, the greater the volume of crude oil that comes out of the various country for export. The taller the bar, the greater the cost of producing the crude. Now, this is data from eight years ago, 2012. And back then, U.S. shale was the most expensive crude in the world to produce. And we only, only kicked out about 4 million barrels a day. That's about Iran at its peak. Now, for a country the size of the United States, that was useful, but it really didn't change the strategic math. That was then. Fast forward eight years, and we've had breakthroughs in water management, data management, drilling technology. And the U.S. is now one of the lowest cost producers in the world and... As of the first of the year, we were net oil exporters. Now, COVID is scrambling all the data, so we're going to have to take another look at this in a few months once things calm down. But the United States is here to stay as a major oil producer, as a net exporter, and it's not like these technologies are going to be uninvented. This is the new normal. The U.S. really doesn't need the rest of the world to keep the lights on. But California does. California is the only state in the lower 48 that is not participating in the shale revolution in some way. It is now, of the states, the single largest oil importer. Two-thirds two of the oil that California uses is imported. About half of that comes from the Persian Gulf, which means that California is now the most energy insecure state. And if there was any sort of shock that interrupted oil production globally, most of the United States would focus would reorganize on the shale sector, which would keep energy prices low and calm, whereas California would be the only state that would still be forced to go out into the international market to source an ever more volatile and ever smaller energy supply. There is an energy crisis in the United States, but it's only for California. Now, the other side of the shale revolution isn't with oil, it's with natural gas. Now, what we've got here is something I'll call the checkbook map because every dot is somewhere where someone can pay the power bill. The biggest 
the most important concentration of checkbooks in human history is this dot right here. This is Marshalltown, Iowa. This is where I'm from. And this is not a rave. Western North Dakota? I don't think so. Now, what's going on here is a problem disconnect with transport. Now, oil is a liquid. You can put it into a bucket. You can put it into a rail car. You can put it into a barge. You can put it into almost any sort of container. And if you can't move it that day, you'll just put it into a holding tank. It's not going to move anywhere on you. But you can't do that with natural gas. It's a gas. It disperses. So you have to have a pressurized collection, transport, and usage system that's leak-free that can process the end product just as fast as it comes in because you almost can't store it anywhere. Now, here in the United States, we've got the world's largest and most versatile natural gas distribution system, but we can barely keep up with what's coming up out of the shale oil fields as a byproduct. So until we can build out the infrastructure, we have to flare it. And you can see those flares from space. Now, what that means is that the United States is now the world's largest supplier of natural gas. And that has driven the price of the stuff well below what you would expect market norms to be. What can't you do with an endless supply of it? We've retooled our entire industrial sector, especially in Petrocom, to use natural gas whenever possible. So we're not using as much oil. We're not even using as much electricity. And that's made the US, the United, the, that has made the United States the lowest cost supplier for all of the chemical inputs that are a basis for everyday life. And of course, the least creative but most important way right now that we're using all this extra natural gas is burning it for electricity. What we've got here is average power prices in the United States for all folks, uh, whether it's residential, industrial, or otherwise. And you'll see that about 10 years ago when the shale revolution began, power prices more or less flatlined. You know, no one ever brings me in because they want to be, they want to feel comfortable. So it's always a little odd when I'm back, but this is the industry that is the most notorious for being gluttons for punishment. Let's just go ahead and jump right in. We're dealing with the end of a lot of things in the next five years. Here's the partial list. Uh, we're going to talk about the ones in the blue or arrows, but this is basically my life these days. When you end a system, the globalized system, not everything makes it to the other side. Things look different, some things do better, but everything changes. And the problem is, is that all of our business plans assume that we're going back to where we were five years ago. And that's, that's not in the math. So my goal here today is to give you an idea, some spotlights on the things that definitely won't go back and how some other things are gonna transform and maybe make your life a little bit easier. Let's start with the simplest conclusion here. If the product that you need comes on one of these, that's what's going away. Internationalized supply chains, Asia heavy, transoceanic, transpacific. Anything that is on this, you have to question whether it's ever gonna be delivered. We now are in a situation where transformers are 36 to 42 months out. Most of those are probably not going to arrive. If it comes on one of these, you're probably okay. Roughly 80% of the trade between America and Mexico is on truck. And there's a number of reasons why that's not great from a logistical point of view, but just for identifying what's going to last. Everything in that category probably will. That's the cheat version. You can go look at your supply chains and make your choices accordingly. Everyone here has seen me at least once, right? No. No? Well, okay, this is for you. This is a standard demographic profile. You got children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other, mortality builds it into a pyramid. And when you have a pyramidal demographic like this, there's a few common characteristics. Number one, it's consumption driven because populations below age 40 consume a lot. They're raising kids or they're buying cars, they're building homes. That spending drives most modern systems, 70% in the case of the United States. But their workers don't have a lot of expertise, so the value add is pretty low. 
They have to import capital because most capital in a system comes from people over age 40, people who the kids have left home and the house has been paid down. And so in a system like this, consumption driven, low investment, high imports, inflationary. This is Korea in the 50s at the dawn of the globalized era. Globalization meant that we could move off the farm and into towns to take industrial jobs. And when you do that, kids go from being free labor to an expense, and adults aren't dumb, so two generations on, here's where the Koreans are now. Very different model. People aged 40 to 65 have decades of work experience. They're capital rich. That pays for investment, that pays for the tax base. But there aren't a lot of young people to consume. So you get a more disinflationary economic model that has to export because there's not enough people locally to buy all the stuff. And the whole world has gone down this Korean path at different speeds from different starting points. But the point is this capital rich environment that we become used to, this was always never more than a moment in time. And it ends this decade because everyone in the advanced world is aging out. And later this decade, the Koreans, the Germans, the Italians, the Russians, the Chinese will all age out of being investment rich and they'll be retirement heavy. And we have no idea what that looks like from an economic point of view. It's never happened in human history ever. In the United States, we're kind of in the middle, largely because we have more elbow room. And this means that we're in a different situation from everybody else, but that still means some of the same lessons apply. So number one, the boomers, are retiring, largest generation we've ever had, largest worker group we've ever had, largest investment base we've ever had. Half of them have already moved into retirement, the rest will over the next six years, and so we know capital costs have to go up. What we've seen so far, we're only about halfway. So capital costs have about tripled in the last three years. It's gonna triple again. Second, largest generation ever, another way of saying largest workforce ever. And if you look at the kids at the bottom, the Zoomers, that's our smallest generation ever. It's simple math. Between the boomers leaving and the Zoomers coming in last year, we lost out of the workforce a half a million workers. It'll be about that same loss again this year. And that number will increase every year for the next 11 before the annual shortfall peaks at about 900,000 in roughly 2034. Then, that number will start to shrink, but we don't expect it to start to grow again in terms of the labor force in large numbers until 2045. So higher borrow, higher borrow, higher borrow. These are the cheapest capital costs and the cheapest labor costs we will have for at least a decade, and in some cases, two. Third, the quality of the incoming labor is very different. Now, the boomers have dominated everything for so long, we think of their examples as normal. They're a social generation. Their kids, the millennials, are a social generation. The incoming ones, the Zoomers, are not a social generation. They're a little pathological. And they are not group workers. They don't want to work anywhere where they're going to see another person or the sky which makes it hard for you guys to do what you're going to do. So again, labor is the cheapest and most familiar to you right now that it's going to be for the next 20 years. Hire everyone you can. And then finally, there's technology. Technology as a sector requires two things. First of all, scads of people in their 20s and early 30s who have malleable minds, who are social, who can work together, who can imagine the future and then build that into a prototype and operationalize it and bring it into mass manufacturing. That has been the millennials for the last 20 years. And they're aging out. The oldest millennials this year turn 44. We're starting to see the leading edge of their midlife crises. And it's, it's delicious. <laughs> but it also means that that younger block of social people just doesn't exist in the way it has in the past. And the second thing you need for tech is capital. Because until you get to that mass manufacturer, there's no income. You have to pay for all of that up front, and the money just isn't there anymore. So even if everything else goes perfectly smoothly, we know we're entering into a tech winter for at least the next 15 years.
the pace of advancement is going to slow considerably. That assumes that it doesn't reverse. Here are the big four economies that we care about. US is obviously the healthiest of the rich world. Mexico, notice how it goes down. Hits a 30-year-old and it goes straight down. Pros and cons of that model. Basically what you're seeing is Mexico was a late comer to industrialization. They really didn't start the move from farm to city until NAFTA won in the 90s. Now, if they keep aging at that rate in 50 years, we're gonna have a very big problem. But in the meantime, when you've got a lot of people who are entering their 20s and 30s who don't have a lot of kids, it's a much more consumption heavy pattern. And so Mexico became our largest trading partner last year. It is a role they will not give up in our lives. There may be some problems down the road in the 2070s. We got time to figure that out, so do they. The Germans do not. The Germans are aging faster than the Koreans. This was always going to be their last decade as an industrial economy. It's not that they're running out of kids. That happened in the 80s. They're now running out of working aged adults. If you get stuff from Germany, it's time to move on. And then there's the Chinese. This was already one of the fastest aging societies in the historical record. And two months ago, the Chinese updated the data. They've had a 70% drop in the birth rate since just 2017. That tells me two things. Number one, China will cease to be a coherent economic power, a coherent nation state this decade. And the Han ethnicity will probably vanish from the world this century. It could happen a lot faster because the Shanghai Academy of Sciences, the, all the brainiacs who are responsible for interpreting the data are like, you know, even the new data is wrong. We've overcounted the population by over 100 million people and these yellow bars probably don't even exist. Let's go through them. Let's start with consumption. This is vehicular miles traveled. They're down to 40% of their peak. Now, obviously COVID is part of that, but in the six months since COVID lockdowns ended, they haven't picked up at all. Why? Demographics. The people who are most likely to be mobile are people in their 20s. And we're now discovering that over the course of the last six years, they've run out. Or you can look at their purchasing power. Here's vehicle sales. Now, whenever a country modernizes in the current age, everybody wants the same four things. They want a smartphone. They want a refrigerator. They want climate control, typically AC. And they want a car. The red line here is the 12-month moving average. You'll notice not only have they not recovered to pre-COVID levels, they peaked a year and a half before COVID. Now, if you think back in the last five, six years, a lot of it has gone down. We had COVID, which scrambled all the data, even if everyone was being conscientious about it, which no one was. China has disappeared into a cult of personality. And the information that we normally would be able to assess either hasn't been there or has been overshadowed. But now that COVID's behind us and the Trump administration is behind us, we're getting a kind of a look under everybody's hood. And we're discovering in the last five, six years, we've hit a lot of turning points that we kind of missed. In the case of China, they now say that the Chinese population peaked last year. But as they're interpreting the data, Five years on, they're discovering actually that probably happened 12 years ago. They found out that the American population became younger than the average Chinese citizen probably four years ago. Turns out that was probably back in 2006. India surpassed China to become the largest population this year. That probably happened in 2014. We're finally getting a kind of a clear look and we've missed China's peak. And it's not that we're at a plateau, it's we're already on the backside of that mountain. And it's only going to accelerate because if you have had a 70% drop in the birth rate, you are looking at national oblivion. Now, how do you get something like this to grow if there's no consumption? Well, you've got three types of economic growth. Your first one's consumption led, that's the United States, that's Mexico. The second one is export led, that's Germany, that's Korea. And the third one is investment-led. You basically throw money to build infrastructure, to build industrial plant. And that activity of the expansion is what drives the system. And that has always been China's number one source of growth. 
Most of it is driven by debt, and this is a debt graphic. So the orange line, that's corporate, the gray line is government, and the blue is household. I need to put this all in perspective because this doesn't look very dramatic, does it? Well, number one, let's look at corporate because that's the biggest chunk. Back at the beginning of this data in 20, 2006, that was already more debt in absolute terms, not relative, absolute terms than the entire American corporate world, and it then doubled. Second, this is in percent of GDP. So if the Chinese have been having 5 to 10% growth a year, that means the debt has been going up by 10 to 20% a year. So the absolute numbers are much bigger than this suggests. Third, the government debt, that's a bigger build than Trump, that's a bigger build than Obama. And it's all local debt. You know, say what you will about the federal government's debt program, is it responsible? No. But they have the Fed to back them out, bail them out if they need to. Because ultimately, federal debt is backed by the currency. We're the global currency. The Federal Reserve can change the money supply with a click of a button. You can't do that if it's Chicago. And so they've added $10.5 trillion of local debt in 15 years, which is about three times what our total local debt exposure is. And then finally, there's households. Now, their household debt has now surpassed US household debt. But the crazy thing is, is that's the good news. You guys have been watching what's been happening with real estate in China lately? Oh my god. Okay, so you know, ghost cities, we've all heard about them. The red circles are where no one lives in a ghost city. And the orange circles are where governments have moved in, but no one has followed. Two things from this. Number one, most of the real estate was paid for with cash. It was not lent. It's owned outright. When you have an investment-led system that distorts the capital structure so much, people are desperate to find ways to preserve and grow their money. The Chinese government prevents people from sending money abroad, so they have to find something at home. They usually go for real estate. So for your average Chinese citizen, over 85% of their savings is in some sort of real estate function. Here's the crazy part. The overbuild in subprime was 3 to 4% of the housing stock in the United States, and we know how that felt. The overbuild in China is 100 to 200%. They have enough spare condos to house somewhere between 1.5 and, and 3 billion people. The market value of product in that sort of environment, it's probably 10 to 20% of what they paid for it. When this goes down, it's not so much that it's a financial hit to the country, no, because it's not on the debt sheet, but it destroys the sum total of the population's life savings. So on top of everything else that the Chinese have going on, you're looking at 1.5, well, 1.3 billion people who are probably going to be a little upset in the not too distant future. And that's assuming there's not a war, which there probably will be. <laughs> this is an energy flow graphic. So the green bars on the left, those are net oil exports. The red on the right are net oil imports. You'll notice how conveniently close together they are. It's about a 5,500 to 7,000 mile sail from the Persian Gulf energy fields to the Northeast Asians based on where you start and where you stop. This route is how everything is shipped right now. The coastal route. It's the short route. <laughs> the Chinese have dozens of weapon systems that can interfere with that route. So if we get into a shooting war because of something with the Iranians or the Saudis, or let's say Russian energy goes offline and prices go up, there's not enough left for everybody. You get a roving naval war between the Japanese and the Chinese. The tankers won't use that route. They'll have you take this longer route that avoids the Chinese coast. China has a big navy, 600 ships, twice ours. But about two-thirds of those vessels would fit in this room. <laughs> Not at the same time, don't be dumb. <laughs> the point is they don't have range. Only about 8 to 10 percent of those ships can sail more than 1,000 miles without a refuel. And that 1,000 mile range assumes that they're going slow in a straight line to save fuel, not that they're like dodging missiles. 
The Chinese cannot project power. They can't control their own sea lanes. They are utterly dependent upon freedom of the seas in order to function. And so if we do get a shooting war, the energy stops, their entire transport system shuts down, the natural gas that they import in, in uh, liquefied form goes away, their chemical sector dies the next day, and China will disassociate within a year. And since they import 80% of the stuff they used to grow their own food, we also get a famine that kills people, hundreds of millions of people, within two years. Now, the Chinese government was well aware of this five years ago. But over the last five years, it stopped functioning as a government because Xi has purged the system so thoroughly of anyone who is even theoretically competent in order to prevent anyone from rising up from below to potentially challenge him or replace him. And in doing so, he has so terrified the bureaucracy at this point that no one will bring him information at all. As a result, the system's breaking down and their ability to collect data, much less process it and publish it, has basically stopped. Now, some of these things are ego-driven. So for example, the Chinese just stopped collecting information on COVID because they didn't want everyone to know how many people died when they did their opening. We just don't know. We don't even have an educated guess, honestly. But some of this stuff really matters. Youth unemployment. We don't know what the status of the next generation is. Patents, which supposedly you need for an information-based society. The information is no longer collected. Uh, bond purchases. How the hell do you have a bond market if you don't know what's on offer and who is buying what? That was supposedly how they were going to get away from an investment-led system, to have a different debt market. Well, that's gone. But the ones that scare me the most are more personal. Political biographies, college dissertations. Because that's how young people get a foot in the system and move up. And G's made sure that they can't so they can never challenge him. So it's just him. Now, my biggest criticism of Barack Obama is he believed he was the smartest person in the room and he would tell people that. His first meeting with the Joint Chiefs, you got all the three and the four stars in the room. He said, I'm smarter than all of you. I can do your jobs better than all of you. Let's assume for the moment that Barack Obama was correct. So, you're gonna do everyone's jobs here and your own. No, no, no. Xi has done that for the entire country. Decisions cannot be made without him. The reason he didn't show up to the G20 summit wasn't because he was mad at the Indians, although he was. It's because he had to do it home, because he's the only one who can make decisions. And I think the best way to kind of explain how this is leading to a state collapse is that stupid balloon. <laughs> now, I'm not a balloon expert. That's just not in my field. And neither is the American president. But we had pretty much the same response when the thing crossed over from Canada. I'm sure Canada's at fault for this somehow. <laughs> it was like, shoot the thing down. Let's see what we're, looking, what we're dealing with. I mean, the balloon was 350 feet across. It was dangling something the size of an Embraer jet. It was like 14 so times the size of the plane that I flew on here yesterday. Which, you know, is tiny unless it's dangling from a balloon. So, I mean, it's obviously it was a spy platform. So let's shoot it down and see what we got. The DOD and the CIA, Secretary and Director, went to President Biden, like, Mr. President, please don't shoot this thing down. I mean, we're not threatened. We really are not concerned about this. We know where it's going. It's gonna float over the missile silos in Montana. But Mr. President, unless you're planning on like firing a few dozen nukes in the next few days, those hatches are gonna be closed. They're always closed, Mr. President. The Chinese will get photos of closed hatches from seven miles away. We are not scared about this. But Mr. President, there's an opportunity here. Because if you let this thing go on its merry way, we'll put a spy helicopter below it, and a spy plane above it, and every whisper sensor we have, and we will track over the next nine days. And we'll copy all their cryptography, We'll trace the signals through the civilian trans or information exchange network. We'll see which satellites they're using. And we will trace it back, not to the city, not to the block, not to the building, not to the floor, not to the office, to the terminal that is doing the controls. And Mr. President, we have the best hackers in the world. We will hack that 
record of a terminal, we will find out who is on it, and then we will trace them using signals intelligence and map out their whole world. Mr. President, the Chinese have handed us the intelligence breakthrough of the decade. All you have to do is let the thing float. And then when it gets over North Carolina, we'll shoot it down and we'll get the hardware too, which we did. We now know that Xi was unaware of the balloon's existence until after it was shot down. He's that much in the dark. No one would tell him. We now know that their Ministry of Defense was unaware of it until it crossed into American airspace. It was just some in the intelligence bureau who thought this is what wolf warrior diplomacy means this is how you stick it to the americans we're seeing breakdowns like this at every government level in every economic sector the capacity of the chinese to make decisions to flow information has stopped this was the dumbest thing i have seen any country do in the last 20 years and if you think back on the last two decades there has been so much dumb this is what state failure looks like in the early stages. So yes, China, 10 years tops, but it can end so much faster. The Germans face a double bind. First, they have a lot more com components that come from over the horizon, places that they cannot deal with, places where they don't have the capacity to enforce any sort of freedom of the seas or market access. The second problem is just as bad. The demographic situation of Europe in general and Germany in the specific is awful. <clears throat> they have to sell beyond the horizon as well. So everything about that engineering model will fail in the next few years. But it's nothing compared to the situation that the Chinese face. The Chinese are the most dependent of the major powers on foreign technology, foreign components, everything pretty much but the capital. Now, a lot of you have heard about the Made in China 2025 program, the idea that the Chinese are aiming to have technological equivalence with the Western world in just five years. <clears throat> yeah, that's not what it means. If you can to a Chinese bureaucrat behind closed doors where their boss can't hear them, they will readily admit that 2025 is just the first step of a very long program and that they don't actually expect to see technological equivalence until 2070. They don't have that kind of time, even if everything went perfectly. If you're looking for the country that is going to be the partner for the United States moving forward, it, it's not in Europe, and it's certainly not in Asia. We need to look a little closer to home. This is a climate map of the United States. <clears throat> that uh, tan area in the middle. That is the temperate zone climate that makes up the bulk of the greater Midwest system, single largest chunk of arable land in the world. In addition, you've got that river system overlaying it, which drops the cost of, con uh, drops the cost of transport through the floor. Floating, thing float <laughs> Floating things is about one-twelfth the cost of moving them by truck. In addition, we have lakes to the north, forests to the north, mountains to the south, deserts to the south, oceans on both sides. We are the most insulated chunk of high quality land in the world. American success does not require decent leadership. I think we've learned that lesson over and over and over the last 30 years. It's the perfect, but compare it to Mexico. Northern Mexico is all desert. Southern Mexico is all tropics. The middle is on an uplift that's about a vertical mile up. Infrastructure development in this sort of area is very difficult. Now, there's pros and cons to this system. It's laughable to think that the Mexicans can grow all their own food, particularly the four closest to the U.S. border you get where it's highland desert. It also means you've got these population clusters that are very tight, no hinterland because there's not a lot of agriculture. So you get an individual dude, a jefe, if you will, who kind of dominates everything in each individual urban center, especially once you get outside of the Mexican city core. Which means that if you're in a northern Mexican border city, or really anywhere north of the central plateau, you're on your own. And you have to reach out to find partners, and pretty much all of them reach north to Americans because we have the capital and the markets and the transport system. And that makes Mexico very, very different compared to 
the rest of Latin America. This is the trade portfolio of Peru. Everything on the right side indicates where the products go, and everything on the left side indicates what the products are by value. Those arrows are pointing to the value added sections, mostly manufacturing. Peru is a standard Latin American country. A lot of low value added products, a lot of ores, a little bit of agriculture, and that's about it. And most of it goes to China because China is a developing country and it's rapidly, ravenously bubbling up whatever resources it can in order to build out its physical infrastructure and industrial plant. This is the role of most of Latin America. Here's Mexico, wildly different. Mexico has all kinds of stuff going for it. Lots of value added because they're integrated into American supply chains. And collectively, this makes Mexico not only more wealthy than Central America as a whole, but far more advanced technologically. It's an upwardly mobile country and Americans enjoy privileged access to it. I'm gonna leave you with a couple of uh, series of thoughts. First of all, I'm actually a little worried about inflation right now. <laughs> we've got a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. We've got a rapid reindustrialization. We've got rapid integration with the Mexicans. We have rapid manufacturing expansion as a result of COVID. And now we're about to have a massive COVID recovery. At the same time, people are also shuffling around and changing their living styles. All of this generates demand. We haven't seen this sort of inflationary impulse since at least the early 80s. Now, I don't think it's going to kill us. And all the things that we're doing are all things that we need to do. But doing them all at the same time is going to generate the greatest surge of inflation that we've seen in at least 40 years. That is going to have some implications politically down the road. And not all that far, like talking around like New Year's. Second, things are getting really interesting with the Russians. Now that uh, the president is down on, on public record calling Putin a killer, because you know he is, uh, we are now pretty much diametrically opposed with the Russians on absolutely everything. But unlike last time around, we don't have a lot of this at stake. Relationships with the Europeans are, are falling. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, the solar winds hack got really ugly, and now we have the American president publicly announcing that a massive counter campaign in terms of cyber is imminent. It's kind of a weird thing to announce publicly if you, if you ask me, but I'm really interested to see how this is going to turn out. Anyway, relation, relations have collapsed in every possible measure, which means that and since we don't have a interest in maintaining stability in Russian relations anymore, we can use a lot of tools that we haven't used in the past. So we can, for example, target energy exports from the Russians, not caring what the impact on the Europeans happens to be. I expect that to get really interesting in just a couple of months. Third, Persian Gulf. It's an energy question. Now, there is a lot of criticism of the Obama administration's uh, deal with the Iranians. Uh, I broadly mirror a lot of those concerns. And the team that is in charge of Biden's foreign policy, it was actually their idea back during the Obama administration to have this deal. But then the Obama team took it and ran with it and kind of punted it. So they fully realized when, what went wrong and why. And they also can acknowledge publicly that the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign had the desired effect. It absolutely smashed the Iranian economy. So they want a new deal, but they don't want a deal that doesn't reflect these changes. So it's gonna be a lot more strict if it happens. The Iranians, of course, want the old deal back. And they've been trying to get America's attention and trying to generate chips that they can trade because without those oil sales that the Trump administration has prevented, Iran has lost the capacity to manipulate the region in the way that it prefers. A lot of the uh, militia groups that they've sponsored in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq only do what they're told when the Iranians pay them, and right now the Iranians can't pay them. So the Iranians are looking for other leverage. Around New Year's, they hijacked a South Korean chemicals tanker in order to get the Americans' attention. The Trump administration did nothing, but then the Biden administration came in and did nothing. We don't care. Shell revolution has made the United States completely agnostic on global energy policy. 
which means if you're Iran, you have to up your game. U.S. probably still isn't going to care. But we now have the Americans likely to throw energy sanctions on the Russians at the same time the Iranians are likely to up their game in the Gulf. That's a perfect storm for global energy policy. It just doesn't affect the U.S. It's not as much as you might think because it requires you have a capital account, which makes it more difficult to regulate your own financial system. You have a lot of hot money going both ways, uh, but it does mean that there is a stability injected into your system and that stability allows you a lot more ballast. So a great example is what happened during the Nixon period when we decided to go off the gold standard. There weren't conversations about that internationally. The Nixon administration just decided almost overnight that we're going to move off and go to a full float. And in the words of the Treasury Secretary at the time, it's our currency, it's your problem. Because the alternative for everyone else was worse, still is today. I mean, leaving aside the idea that the idea that the dollar is going away is silly. Uh, let's say it, the dollar did break as the reserve currency overnight. Let's just say that happened. Uh, then we're a normal currency. And we're still the currency for the U.S. domestic economy. And roughly 90% of the U.S. economy is held within the United States. And another 5% is held within Mexico and Canada. So you only really have 5% exposure to the wider world. Uh, as for all of the debt, yes, a large portion of that is held abroad. But the U.S. still has control over its own money supply. And that debt is already out there. And every once in a while, there's this delightful conversation uh, between some wackadoo Chinese ideologue and the U.S. Fed in St. Louis, where the wackadoo ideologue says, you know, you know, if we really want to stick to the United States, we're just going to dump all $3 trillion of our uh, bond holdings overnight. And you always get the same snarky response from the St. Louis Fed that says something like, well, you know, that would be really interesting because the... Uh, the, tr the debt would probably trade at 30 cents on the dollar very, very quickly. But I don't know if you knew this, China, but the U.S. Federal Reserve controls the U.S. money supply. And it's mostly digital now. So we would just like click a couple buttons and expand the money supply by the exact number of that $3 trillion discounted 70% and retire the whole thing. You would save us over $2 trillion in an hour. And you would be out over two trillion dollars in an hour that would be brilliant please do that and then we never hear from that ideologue again because he's brought shame to china for being so stupid uh so no uh even in the worst case scenario where like martian currency takes over the u.s <laughs> is still a normal currency for u.s purposes now there is a cost in that scenario that would probably force our political leaders to be a little bit more judicious with their spending in the, in the long run because we wouldn't be able to just dump our debt on everyone else's system that's probably the real superpower it allows us to not be fiscally responsible but beyond that which i would argue would probably it gives us the ability to inject ourselves into any economic exchange and i don't mean to minimize how useful that can be that's one of the reasons why the sanctions on iran have been so effective and even relatively light sanctions in comparison on russia have been effective because if brazil and china are going to do a traditional exchange the chinese exchange yuan for dollars and then the dollars are exchanged for reals or or going back the other direction and that allows the united states to interrupt any exchange should it choose so now the fed is not staffed to monitor global monetary exchanges so we don't do that unless there's a specific sanctions regime in place but we have the option and in a world of demographic decline and geopolitical upheaval options are good uh, crypto i mean it really depends on which crypto asset but let's just use bitcoin because most people are familiar with that one it's a little bit more sophisticated uh they they print currency out of thin air and then they get someone to buy it from them there's a second step there that's basically a pyramid scheme <laughs> and, and and you know I, I know we didn't talk about this here uh, during the discussion but it, it feels like there was a whole period of time where people were saying that those digital currencies were going to be the ones that superseded the U.S. dollar for that exact reason, because they're like, well, oh, the U.S. just prints money. Why can't we just print money? <laughs> I would argue that's not a great reason. <laughs> what do you make of him saying that? That, well, you know, they print money out of thin air. 
people say the government does too, and maybe we do, but we're the government. Well, the government is also responsible for regulating a $23 trillion economic system and managing roughly $25 trillion in global trade. So the scale and the reach and the active management that is required to do that also requires a monetary authority that can expand and shrink the monetary supply as is necessary. One of the many, 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 many things that the crypto bros miss is that the money supply is not a one directional thing. And if the entire money supply is held by private interests, who has to give it up when it's time to go the other direction? And who decides who has to give it up? The thing that would help the most is building out processing capacity for any, any, and all of the materials that are going to be necessary as we lose Russian and Chinese supplies. The Inflation Reduction Act, which is a stupid name for what it actually does, is actually our first step in that direction since the 1940s. And so it's inefficient and it's overly expensive and it's sloppy. But for the first time we've done it, it's not bad. Oh, I'm not a financial guy, so know, let me just kind of give you the headline. Yeah. We're entering a world of capital shortage. The baby boomers are retiring globally. They're taking all their money with them. The next generation down, no matter where you are, no matter what country you're in, is smaller. So we're, if capital is more expensive, it is going to be able to demand higher returns. So if you can hold on through this transition, we're going to go back to a world like we had in the 1980s, where your financial planner actually had to do work. Couldn't just throw money at these artificial, maybe AI generated trading platforms or do high frequency trading. It's going to be about the value. And honestly, I think we're about better set up for that even today. So if you do have capital, all you have to do is wait a couple of years and the market will take care of you. Well, <laughs> all of those would be shocking events that I had not forecast. I don't think any of those are very likely. I'm trying to come okay. up with something that might actually has a, has a slight chance of actually happening. Um, I could see France leaving the European Union. Wow. Okay. We'll talk again. So For them, it was always a political project, not an economic one. And I know. clearly it's now starting to cause some economic. Uh, I like to figure out how things work, why things work and where that takes us. And I like to do it while I'm backpacking. So I need to get to a place where the world can't reach me. I spend at least two weeks backpacking every summer. I'm going to try to make that six this summer. Tour? Yeah, backpacking tour when you sure. were backpacking. Sure, oh, well, that's easy. I mean, it's been a long time, but a place called Cascade Saddle in New Zealand. Uh, it has alpine glow, it has morning rainbows, and you are a vertical kilometer and a half directly above the valley floor. It's a straight drop down. Mm -hmm. Now, it's um, I've freed up a little bit of time, so I am noodling over some ideas, but I'm not there yet. Uh, everything is e most easily accessible through the website, which is zeihan.com. That's where you can sign up for the newsletter. That's where you can sign up for the video log, and that's where all of the information about all of the books are.